Today, we're going to be taking a look at a lost version of Back to the Future without Michael J. Fox. A deleted scene that was banned from the franchise. And rounding things off of discussing a possibly lost version of the Back to the Future ride. All of this and more. And if you like videos about missing content, then be sure to subscribe. Anyway, enough of the context, it's time to head back to the past. It's pretty fairly well known that when they started filming Back to the Future, that director Robert Zemeckis really wanted to cast Michael J. Fox as Marty McFly, but wasn't able to due to Fox being committed to the sitcom Family Ties, and the filmmakers were given a concrete deadline to start filming the movie, so they cast Eric Stoltz to lead the film instead. But after five weeks of filming, the filmmakers weren't entirely pleased with the performance that Eric was giving. Stoltz was great and well known for doing a dramatic performance, but according to the crew he was just lacking that comedic edge that the film really needed. Eric was just a bit too blunt with the delivery, so it was a tough decision, but they decided to completely refilm the movie, working out a new schedule and deal to get Michael J. Fox on board to play Marty for the film, working on the movie weekday evenings and throughout the daytime during weekends, with poor Michael only having 5 hours worth of sleep per day. Because of this, Eric Stoltz was dropped from the project, with the first appearance of the DeLorean being the final scene he worked on. While it's never been confirmed on how much of the movie was actually filmed, it was presumably quite a large portion that was completed with Eric Stoltz. That according to Biff actor Thomas F. Wilson, that things were so far along that the actors were asking each other as to what they were doing next. Apparently, a lot of footage from the other actors from the Eric Stoltz shoot was repurposed again for the final film, with the only new material being required from those scenes was the new footage of Michael J. Fox reacting, although which shots were and weren't has never been officially confirmed. For years, it was believed that this shot of Marty punching Biff was one of the original takes from Eric Stoltz, due to actor Thomas F. Wilson not recalling filming that angle with Michael J. Fox. But according to the film's editor Harry Karamidas, this isn't a shot with Eric Stoltz in it, the individual playing Marty is actually a stunt double, so probably why Thomas couldn't remember filming that scene with Michael. The Eric Stoltz version of Back to the Future is perhaps the most famous long lost alternative cut to a movie being name dropped in the 2023 Flash film, where in one of the alternate realities they go to in the film, they find a universe where the Back to the Future movie starred Eric Stoltz instead. For years, no footage could be seen of this alternative cut. It wouldn't be until the 2010 documentary Tales from the Future that they included snippets of the Eric Stoltz footage. The three shots that were used go mute and only last for about 24 seconds. So certainly, not everything that was filmed with Eric, but Robert Zemeckis has occasionally promised in interviews that more footage with Eric Stoltz will be released one day. The filmmakers even revealed that they did once have the opportunity to dispose of the footage, but held on to the material, possibly seeing the footage coming in handy for some grander purpose, so it's not a question if the footage will ever see the light of day, but instead, when will it? Something else I would love to see when that day finally arrives is perhaps a full interview and documentary with Eric Stoltz, as over the years he's very rarely ever acknowledged that he was in the film. From what I could find, the only time we ever talked about his experience with Back to the Future is in a 2007 interview with Movie Hole, and I quote, you know, it was 20 something years ago and I rarely look back, if at all, but in retrospect. I think just getting through that difficult period helped me realise how freeing it really was. I went back to acting school, I moved to Europe, I did some plays in New York and I actually invested in… myself, in a way that was much healthier for me. If I would have become a massive star, I don't know if I would have gone into therapy. On the other hand, I would have been exceedingly rich which would have been wonderful, haha. <laughs> End quote. So, by the sounds of it, at least it's nice that he's come to peace with the whole situation, and afterwards Mr. Stoltz has had a respectful career in his own right. The day that we finally see that Back to the Future rough cut, it may not be the same film that we all fell in love with, but I say, it might just be nice to pay tribute to the original Marty McFly.
It's fairly well known amongst Back to the Future fans that after the completion of the first movie, there was no sequel in mind, with the ending intending to be played up for laughs. But given that the first movie was a smash hit, and the ending could naturally lead on to a follow-up, it was certainly a tempting opportunity that the filmmakers couldn't resist. When the first movie came to VHS the following year of 1986, a 2B continue card was added at the end, reassuring viewers who loved the first film that a follow up was on the way. Now, typically, when a movie's in its early stages of development, it's not uncommon for an early version to be completely different from the final product. Like the early drafts of the first movie originally had the time machine as a refrigerator. Well, the first draft of the second movie was actually quite similar in a lot of ways to the final flick, but then yet again, massively deviates like we still go to the future of 2015, and the sports almanac plays a big role for the story, but where the deviations are apparent. Jennifer isn't knocked out in the future scenes, and actually participates in the adventure with Marty, at least for the first quarter of the script. We also find out that Marty's family of the future have fallen into hard times, Marty being so desperate for cash that he tends to borrow money from his children, and makes really bad investments such as trying to win the lottery. He's on very bad terms with the rest of his extended family such as his parents and siblings, that he can't turn to them to help him with his troubles. It gets so bad that his future wife Jennifer confronts him, and straight up tells Marty that she's filing for a divorce so not a very optimistic future for the couple. The actual reason as to why Doc Brown brought Marty to the future was in the hope that he could give his son a bit of a pep talk, since Marty of 2015 isn't exactly a dad role model. What happens to us in the future? What, do we become assholes or something? Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, now we know why he had to think about that question. Should he either be truthful or play it cool? On a slightly more optimistic note of the future, there was one prediction that the script very nearly got right. In the local theatre, instead of Jaws 19 playing, it's instead the new monster feature Godzilla 2015, which in the real world, there was a new Godzilla movie that was released in 2014, so, you know, just one year off. When we head back to the year of 1985, the script is yet again very similar to the final film. Thanks to his riches, Biff is virtually in power. Hill Valley is run down and riddled with crime. George McFly is killed off in this timeline, and Lorraine ends up marrying Biff. But unlike the film, it isn't all bad. I mean, Biff did try to refix the clock by turning it into a digital clock. So, you know, little something. But he's still no angel. Through his connections, he's out to kill Marty. In fact, now Marty is literally on the run from the police. And there's a most exciting escape scene, where Doc and Marty need to travel through time. But with their engine not working and the cops onto them, they need to think fast. So, with the flight mode still in working use, Doc and Marty takes the vehicle to the air, and does a swift nosedive down, with there being just enough acceleration to get the car up to 88 miles per hour, allowing them to travel through time. The script is more or less very similar to the final film that we got as an early version, with the exception of the third and final act, where Doc and Marty don't go back to 1955, but instead 1967. Way, Vernie. That, that's just a hippie. That people looked like this in the 60s. The goal is still the same of retrieving the sports almanac. However, the new perils the time travelers are put through is where Marty ends up getting arrested after a police officer believes that he's part of a Vietnam War protest. Fortunately for Marty, his mum Lorraine helps bail him out, with her believing that he's part of the protesters, although the money she ends up using was meant to be used for her and her husband's 10th year wedding anniversary holiday, and it turns out it was that holiday where Marty was conceived. So in terms of his existence, that might be a wee bit awkward for him. To make things slightly more complicated, Doc Brown from the 60s ends up seeing and tries to track down Marty, with Marty trying to make sure that both Doc Browns don't end up meeting one another. The film ends with everything restored. Back in the year of 1985, Doc Brown drives off in his DeLorean, with Marty and Jennifer watching him on, still leaving it open to a part three, where in the final sequel film it ends on a cliffhanger. Great Scott. George McFly is completely absent from the first draft, 
being deceased and passing away off screen in the 2015 future, and then being explained that he had gone away in the 1960s scenes, being a way to work around from the absence of Kristen Glover, the actor who played George McFly, Marty's dad in the first movie, who didn't return for Back to the Future Part 2 and 3. Although they did semi-work in George McFly into the sequels, by getting Jeffrey Wiseman in heavy makeup to play him instead. Although they did this without Glover's blessing, which Christian Glover was successful in suing the production into using his likeness. This inadvertently changed the Hollywood system, which now companies had to seek out the blessing of using actors' likenesses if they were not involved with said project. Overall, the first draft is certainly an interesting outline, but I think the concept for the final movie, with Doc Brown and Marty going back to the first flick, it made it more of a fun adventure. Anyway, the sequel script to the first draft was finally made available via the backstothefuture.com website, giving fans a curious what if on what the first follow-up movie would have been like. Back to the Future 3 was released on May 25th of 1990 to kickstart that year's summer season. Burr, airing on television just three weeks later, was the 21 minute special The Secrets of the Back to the Future trilogy, hosted by Kirk Cameron on the set of the 19th century Hill Valley of Back to the Future 3. In the program, Cameron reads and answers many fan questions about the trilogy, and shows off some then, some never before seen content such as the deleted scenes. When Cameron was explaining the minor plot hole of where did Marty get modern day hair dryer in the 1950s, they show the deleted scene where young Doc is going through older Doc's personal belongings in a briefcase that Marty accidentally brought with him the DeLorean. Inside the contents is a hair dryer. A hair dryer? Don't they have towels in the future? And a very interesting magazine. Ooh, suddenly the future is looking a whole lot better. They also show two deleted scenes from Back to the Future 2. Older Biff vanishing in 2015. The documentary even explains as to why Biff is fading away. That at some point in the mid 90s that his wife Lorraine shoots and kills Biff. Hence why he doesn't exist in 2015. And the other cut content is Marty coming across the derelict ruin of his high school. For 12 years, these would be the only deleted scenes that would be publicly available to watch from the trilogy. The special received a release on VHS as part of a four pack tape set of the whole trilogy. It was then featured as a bonus feature on the 2002 Back to the Future 3 DVD and has been included on the multiple re-releases of the Back to the Future trilogy. Ever since it was first premiered on television, the special has remained unedited or altered. This especially includes the ending. Is there gonna be a Back to the Future part four? Well, it doesn't look likely, partner. But you know, Back to the Future will live on in Back to the Future The Ride. It opens in November of 1990 at Universal Studios Florida. Well, the thing is, the ride kind of got delayed. It didn't open until May of 1991, just about seven months slightly off. But hey, better late than never. In 2002, Back to the Future fans were in for a treat as the whole trilogy was released on DVD, including new documentaries as part of the bonus features. But for the first time in over 12 years, the release featured even more never before seen deleted content, which would have been extremely exciting for Back to the Future fans of the time. Now granted, some of it you can see as to why it was removed from the final edit. You know, this is the kind of thing that could screw me up permanently. Well, what if I go back to the future and I end up being gay? Why shouldn't you be happy? Y yeah, perhaps dialogue like that wouldn't have aged the most delicately. But hey, it's fun to see more footage from the trilogy that I didn't know that existed. There she is, man, there's a bitch! Son of a bitch, she cheating, man! When it came to the Blu-ray release, some of the deleted scenes got to be selected to be scanned in true HD. 
However, two of them, nicknamed the Pinch Me scene and the Phone Booth scene, are still only available in the DVD SD format. But then, for the cutscene named Doc's Personal Belongings, the first deleted scene to ever be made publicly available from the trilogy, appears that it has been retransferred, but has a noticeable pixelation artifact retain on it. Most noticeable when Doc Brown is opening up the briefcase. But then, there was one deleted scene from the first Back to the Future, that was made available on the initial DVD release, but then was pulled from all subsequent home media releases. After facing the tension of doing three lung operations in a row, I like to relax by lighting up a Sir Randolph. This was a cigarette commercial that would have been seen on the television with Lorraine's family while they were having dinner. Cigarette commercials used to be abundant on television, although that all changed by 1971, where cigarette commercials were banned off television after long-term health risks was becoming more widely known about the product. Initially, the scene was scripted of Marty being a little bit stunned of seeing an advert of cigarettes being indoors, and Lorraine being in disbelief that cigarettes can cause lung cancer. However, it was never filmed, as Bob Gale said in a commentary over the deleted scene, that they realised after filming it, that it was going to be difficult to show off the fake ad, without stopping the whole movie to show it off. The cut sequence was hidden on the DVD content, and required the home user to do a little bit of digging to source the hidden deleted scene, although on future home media re-releases, the sequence wasn't included even as a hidden easter egg. This might be down to the complicated history of cigarette commercials, and perhaps presenting a fake advert without any context, it may have led to the wrong interpreted message. In 1991, CBS launched the Back to the Future animated series. The show is set shortly after the events of Back to the Future 3, about Doc and his family living in the 1990s, with Marty joining in on the Browns' fun. Doc Brown not only still has his train time machine that he had at the end of Back to the Future 3, but he has also rebuilt his DeLorean. A current recurring antagonist for the series is Biff and his relatives. That one Allosaur resembles Biff Tannen! Only not so ugly. With Thomas F. Wilson reprising his role from the movies. What's your problem, butthead? The series does have live action segments with Doc Brown, which is joyfully played by Christopher Lloyd, although he doesn't provide the voice for his cartoon counterpart. The role was instead fulfilled by Dan Castaneda, who has had a long, fruitful career of doing animated voice work, best well known for being the voice of Homer Simpson. Fame Phil Nye in the Science Guy also appears in the show giving demonstrations on experiments that the viewers can do from home. Doc Brown then tries to replicate it, but doesn't end up pulling it off so well. Mary Steenburgen, who played Kerry in part 3 of the movies, additionally comes to the animated series to reprise her role as Doc Brown's partner. The show ran for two seasons as standard for animated series of the time. Second seasons are usually commissioned fairly close to the first episode's airing, just in case if the program proves to be popular, so a new batch of episodes wouldn't be too far around the corner for fans to enjoy. However, no further episodes were commissioned after season 2, as CBS cited that the viewing figures were not high enough to justify the expense of producing more episodes. The final episode aired on Boxing Day of 1992. CBS would rerun the episodes until August of 1993. Ten years later, the show did briefly return on American television on the Fox block. Between March and August of 2003, back in the early 90s, episodes of the show did get a release on VHS and Laserdisc, but only the 18 out of 26 episodes made it to home media, meaning that for a while it was a bit difficult to get to enjoy the whole series. By the advent of the internet, it was achievable to unofficially watch all the episodes, thanks to off-air fan recordings, to fill in the missing gaps. Although, by 2015, in the lead-up to the future dates seen in Back to the Future 2, the trilogy of movies received a special box set release. 
which included the animated series alongside it. The following year in 2016, series 1 and 2 could be purchased individually on DVD, making it a show no longer so rare and inaccessible to get. The Smash Universal attraction of Back to the Future The Ride was allegedly conceived after Spielberg had a preview show of the Disney ride Star Tours, that during the screening George Lucas made the remark of Universal not being capable enough of making something as technically complex. Boss Films was initially hired on to create the visuals of the ride, with visual effects artist Richard Edlin supervising the whole project. Him and the company spent at least one year developing the simulation, with prototype demos being created, although ultimately Bosque Films wouldn't see the project through. The final footage was created by Entertainment Design Workshop, led by Douglas Trumbull, who had had previous experience into doing model work for 2001 A Space Odyssey and Blade Runner. Exactly why Bosque Films wasn't involved with the ride's final development isn't entirely clear. Rumours suggest that the Entertainment Design Workshop were willing to do the commission work for a lower fee, although it's been largely suggested that Universal weren't immensely pleased with the direction of the storyline, nor were impressed of the test reels of the footage. Apparently Bosque Films' version of the ride was a rundown of the movies and that there was going to be a portion of the ride where the guests would have been surrounded by blimps. While this version of the ride never came to fruition, we do know that there were at least test simulations that were created of it, but it isn't known if any of that simulation test footage still exists. A story has circulated that the original villain for the Back to the Future ride would have been Doc Brown's evil twin brother, although if this was the original plot to Bosque Film's version, or an early rendition when Douglas Trumbull got involved, is not entirely known. Ultimately, the final ride's plot is presumably set sometime after Back to the Future 3, featuring Doc Brown, where he set down the foundations of the Institute of Future Technologies, where he's recently unveiled his newest invention, the eight-seated DeLorean Time Vehicle, inviting the guests on to try out the new DeLorean, by a safety experiment travelling one day into the future. However, things don't quite go according to plan when Biff from the 50s stows away on a time vehicle after one of Doc Brown's assistants was doing an experiment in 1955. From there, Biff traps Doc and decides to take the DeLorean out for a little spin, leaving it up to the guests to hop on board the new eight-seater DeLorean, while Doc remote controls the vehicle throughout time chasing Biff to get him safely back to the Institute. The entire experience lasted for about 30 minutes, with the main ride portion being a motion simulation lasting for about 4 minutes. The footage that was filmed and projected was filmed on Omnimax, essentially using a fish-eyed wide lens, a much more bigger screen than IMAX. With a budget of $40 million, Universal had created the biggest ride simulator made so far. The ride would open up in three of Universal's parks, Hollywood, Florida and Japan. Although today, all of the Back to the Future attractions have now since closed. However, fortunately Universal had included the ride's footage as a bonus feature on the 2010 Blu-ray set. Unfortunately though, with the ride's footage being in a wider scope than IMAX, this proved to be difficult to bring to the home media format. As a result, the footage is severely cropped and the quality that the copies were used were not in the best of conditions. However, this isn't the only footage that's been circulating from the ride. Famously, an employee back in 93 was able to make a VHS copy of the Laserdisc Masters that were used for the ride, and was circulating them within the fan market. It's via this and other sources that Back to the Future fans have been trying to recreate the original IMAX picture. The most dedicated enthusiast to take on this challenge is YouTube channel Femix Lee Dog, and I've got to say, their ambition has certainly paid off. It's also worth pointing out that there's an early rough cut version of the ride footage circulating online, having incomplete special and sound effects and also has an alternative outtake at the very end with Biff that was never shown anywhere else on either the ride or home media format. Button! 